having a look uh, at some of the sort of key data points around the world. So during uh, COVID, so payments were flat or slightly declining at a global level because people are home, not going to the shop. However, some some of our big online partners definitely saw massive growth, you know, 30, 40% growth as people went online. So a year of disruption in this sector as well, a year of opportunity uh, and a year of doing things differently. The format of payments in one shape or form has also been around in human existence for around 40,000 years. We've been trading in some way, shape or form. Currency, around 5,000 years. So it's almost part of the human DNA is how we transact and make payments and why it's still relevant today. So in terms uh, of today, it's around the future of payments. So in terms of our panel, we've got uh, some great uh, speakers who are with us today, uh, both here in person and line. So I will introduce Dave, who's online uh, shortly as we go through. So firstly, uh, William Miao, William in the middle. So William is from Paymark, so we're all pretty familiar with um, Paymark, and he's the head of online payments. Lewis Billinghurst from Westpac. Uh, who's Head of Digital Ventures. Josh Daniel at the end, who's CEO of a company called Arkahoo, a disruptor in this particular space. And online is Dave Engel from AWS, so a global participant. And Dave is the Business Development Manager for the FinTech industry of uh, AWS, coming in from Australia. So just in terms of the mechanics of how we will work uh, today, the person I haven't introduced yet is our facilitator, Steve Cowper, uh, with us here at Front, otherwise known as Skippy. You'll figure out why as soon as he starts talking, but Skippy is going to be the facilitator slash referee as we work through this. Um, and we want to keep this informative and a bit informal, hence why you've all got a, a drink. Those online, you're welcome to get a drink to join us uh, as well. We, we don't make any judgments of whatever time zone that you're in. Uh, so Skippy will moderate uh, the session as we as we go through, it's not all about technology. So we've purposely chosen the participants today to talk about business experiences, some thought leadership, the ups and downs of payments. So we wanna make it more of a business uh, discussion. At the end, we will open up for questions and you can do that in one or two ways. So un online participants, or even while you're here, can use Slido, uh, or for those that are here, old school hand up at the end and we'll give them the opportunity to to ask the panelists some questions. So without further ado, I will hand over to Skippy. Thank you, Jason. And thank you for all coming uh, to this event. We're feeling very privileged to have our panelists join us today um, and contribute to the conversation within the New Zealand ecosystem. And just to look across the table and at our big screen over there, we actually have some multi-generational uh, representation of payments industry. Westpac arrived in New Zealand in 1861, founded seven branches off the back of the gold rush in Otago and really focused on the ability to trade that gold um, and ease for merchants. Uh, Paymark um, is here. Paymark came about in 1989. Uh, when four banks at the time decided to consolidate two payment networks into one and actually put New Zealand really at the head of the adoption of FPOS, almost 14 years ahead of the UK. And then we have Arkahu, you know, that um, here is the, the new age disruptor leveraging the change that Cloud's brought about and obviously Dave representing AWS that really enables innovation at scale um, and, and significant change. So... Once again, thank you to the organisations. Once again, thank you to yourselves for joining us here today. What I would like to do um, is we'll start with Lewis. Um, just tell us about the role of, uh, of digital ventures at Westpac. Sure. Um, I'm not 160 years old. Um, I work for a business that is, though. Um, so uh, my role within the bank is all around partnerships. Um, so we we build and partner with um, dev companies like Frond and other businesses in Auckland um, to produce new propositions to um, for Westpac customers or broader um, New Zealanders. We also partner with um, fintechs, both um, great New Zealand-based um, fintechs like Josh and Aku and the team, um, but also fintechs overseas. Um, and we also recently invest. So corporate venture capital um, into those said fintechs as well. So our um, space in the bank is all around kind of partnerships and bringing new propositions um, to New Zealanders. 
Thank you very much. And Will, can you tell us a little bit about your role at, at Paymark in innovation and online payments? Thanks, Skippy. So as Skippy mentioned, Paymark has, well, first of all, if you know Paymark and know that we're not Kmart, you probably know that we run the FPOS network in New Zealand, and we have been doing that for the last 30 years. It's a reliable network, but it is a 30-year piece of technology, which means really the only interface into that network is, as we all know, FPOS machine, what we call terminals. And as people are really paying these days, not and gradually not really exclusively on an FPOS machine per se anymore, is online is paying from Amazon friends, right? Your Echo, Alexa, and also from your car, et cetera. Really, we need to think about modernizing that payment infrastructure. So we've been working with Bron, but also a lot with our bank partners, Westpac, and a few other banks in the room today to really uh, upgrade the links in through open banking technologies, which we'll touch on very shortly to be basically enable all the other payment methods. And that's mainly my role. And over to Josh, the young buck disruptor, new entrant player. Hi everyone, Josh Daniel from Akahu. So we're an open finance infrastructure provider. And that means that we have a set of integrations with the New Zealand banks, and we allow consumers to connect those accounts to other apps. So in payments, what that could mean is that you can connect your bank account to an app like Uber or Airbnb and use it as your payment method, much like you connect a card at the moment. So there are a whole lot of use cases that can be unleashed with this kind of connectivity, and that's what we're looking to enable at Akahu. And Dave, all the way from Australia, um, can you just tell us about your role and the role of AWS in fintech across ANZ? Sure, happy to. So actually all the way from Chicago, but uh, now in Australia, uh, in case anybody's wondering about the accent. Um, so my role is fintech business development manager at AWS, uh, and that means that I focus on accelerating, accelerating the growth of our fintech customers. So the way that the account team works is you all have an account manager who looks after the day-to-day -day activity of the customer. We have solution architects who focus on the technical side of the customer. And then my focus is, up, is purely growth. So how do we help our fintech customers grow faster? Um, we do that through two ways. So we do that through what we call one-to-one -one relationship management. So that might be helping customers find their customers. So somebody like Westpac might come to me and say, we have this particular use case. Can you help find us fintechs to solve it? And so I will do that. Equally from the fintech to customers, fintechs will tell us who they're targeting and we'll help uh, try to help um, make those introductions. We also identify partnership or distribution opportunities. So who are fintechs or banks that can actually be distribution partners for our fintechs to help accelerate their growth. Uh, and then finally, investor connections. So we spend a fair amount of our time helping our customers identify uh, capital. So where are places that they can raise capital from, which is ultimately the fuel of their growth. So that's the one-on-one -on -one side. And then on the ecosystem side, what we do is we focus on where can AWS focus within the ecosystem itself to accelerate the growth of the ecosystem. Um, unsurprisingly, the focus last year and one of the main focuses this year is around open banking. Uh, we, we truly believe that open banking is the future of finance. Uh, and we see our role as helping to accelerate our customers' journey towards open banking and in particular towards becoming data recipients. So our customers are the ones who want to consume the data of the fintechs as opposed to the banks who want to send out the data. Uh, and so we have a whole range of tools and partners and reference architectures and funding mechanisms that help um, excel our customers accelerate their journey towards being able to access open banking data. Thank you very much. And that's potentially a good segue because uh, do we have someone from Payments NZ here? I know we had some people register, but they commissioned a report late last year. Um, and one of the questions they asked is, um, and I'll ask the audience here, put your hand up if you would confidently be able to articulate what open banking is. <laughs> sort of, sort of. Yeah, so 96% of, uh, of respondents admitted um, that they could not. Um, so I'm going to throw it over to our panellists and feel free to jump into the room first. You can all grab the mic. How, how would you define open banking? Josh, look, you look like you're ready to go. Well, I think at the heart of it is the ability for consumers to access the data that organisations hold about them and to control it or leverage it or use it in some way. So it, it's sort of the metaphor of open banking works easiest when you're talking about retrieving data from an account like transaction data. But in a similar way, you can exchange data, you can send data to that account like a payment instruction. 
So you can initiate actions as well as just retrieve information. Um, so at the heart of it is putting consumers in control of their data and allowing new use cases through that. I'll probably jump in from a payments point of view. So if you think about, to Josh's point, right, allowing and giving permission for third parties to access data that bank holds on your behalf to basically access other services that the third parties provide, that's the essence. From a payments point of view, you could actually think of FPOS being a form of open banking. It's just we didn't know that was open banking, right? You're actually trusting Paymark being the third party provider to basically access the fund in your bank through a secure bank link, and then be able to basically move that money from your account to the merchant's account. And with this open banking technology, we're actually trying to do the same, except um, A, there will be more than just payments that's being moved. It could be account information, it could be an identity, your transaction data, uh, et cetera but it also could be payments, but also in a way that is not constrained to just a physical infrastructure that is terminal. So it could be your app, you could link it to other devices in the, the internet, well, internet of age, but also no device at all with your biometry as sort of the future future. Um, yeah, I'm not, not much to add on that. Um, Open making literally is a buzzword. Um, there's two parts of it. There's data and payments. Um, that's at its simplest kind of form. And how can you um, securely give a consumer um, consented um, access to that information? And so data and, and payments. The use case scenarios for open banking uh, are immense. And that's the exciting part. What this will enable in terms of the, the ecosystem or, or industry for financial services um, is, is amazing. Like, And how do we tap into that um, innovation spirit that New Zealanders have to build on top of both of those things, access to payments and access to data to create new propositions. And one thing I'd add just on that 96% comment, like I expect that a lot of people won't ever know what open banking or consumer data rights or what the underlying infrastructure regulations that support these use cases are. And a lot of ways I think it doesn't really matter. Like if we think about the use cases that have actually been around in New Zealand for a while, like connecting your bank transaction data into zero or connecting your bank accounts to support a home loan application. They are use cases of open banking, but we don't call them that and we don't need to. So it needs to work well, needs to be done right, but doesn't need to get to 100% knowledge of the term and how it works under the hood, in my opinion. So uh, if I could, just one thing that I would add to that. Um, so I think all those definitions are really spot on. One of the things that we try to do at AWS, one of our leadership principles is think big. And that means kind of positioning anything that we do in the larger picture. And ultimately what open banking is, is it's the first step of the open data economy. Um, so right now in Australia, there's something called the CDR uh, regime, the consumer data right regime. Open banking is just step one. Right now, the government is asking for comment on open energy. They've also committed to doing open telco, open insurance, probably open superannuation fund. And that's just open finance. We also expect to see both regulated sharing of data, like through the CDR, as well as voluntary sharing of data. So you might get social media apps or food ordering apps or exercise apps that are also now starting to open up their APIs and sharing data. And ultimately, what we're all doing right now is really just getting ourselves ready and match fit for the open data economy, which is what's gonna be you know, the norm in five to 10 years. So what I'm hearing from you is there's, there's a number of drivers that are, are driving sort of modernization towards this open data regime, looking first at open banking and modernizing our payments. In, in a New Zealand context, are you seeing consumer behaviour and expectations change to pull this um, innovation and modernisation? And if so, how? 100%. Like, it's very easy to get caught up in the, the tech of this, this stuff or the regulatory kind of acronyms, right? Um, but if you focus on, like, what that customer outcome is, it starts to get really interesting. Because if you start thinking about um, the current state of payments in New Zealand, you go, well, it's not broken. Like, all the banks have good quality mobile apps. If I wanted to pay um, Skippy back for the, the beer... I can do that with my phone. That's quite modern and good. But until you go to that next level of detail, you start to understand the friction that, that actually exists in our payment infrastructure. So take that paying Skippy back for the, for the beer conversation, right? That typically goes, goes like, um, Skippy, what's your bank account? 
unless Skippy's Rain Man, he generally can't remember that. And so he has to go into his mobile app, get that long digit number, share it with me. I then open my banking app, put that in, and then that money will then eventually get transferred to him some time might be real time if we're the same bank but you don't ask that question when you're in that, in that conversation so you go into that layer of kind of detail of how people kind of try to pay each other person to person and there is quite a bit of friction um, that exists kind of today and so that's kind of when you start to go how would you solve that and using kind of say apis or, or technology to face into that you can create a whole different experience that removes all that friction and so for us, that's when it gets really interesting to go, what does that scenario look like when you remove the friction? And so we all have that situation, right, where um, you have coffee ledgers in your head. Because, like, oh, last time we went to cof um, coffee with Skippy, I think I paid, so he'll pay this time. And we run these social ledgers in our heads, right? And so because of that, it's because of the friction that if it required to pay Skippy the five bucks for the coffees too much, it's like, oh, I'll just remember it and you get me next time. So if you remove that kind of friction, what kind of experiences would that create? Um, and then if you go even deeper again at an emotional level for New Zealanders, right? So New Zealanders, we like to kind of internalize shit. So, so if you compare us with, say, um, Americans and gross generalization here, but an American, if you owe American $5, they'll say, hey, pay me back $5. Like they, they're more extroverted. New Zealanders, we like to internalize that stuff, right? So we go, oh, Skippy didn't pay me back that five bucks. It's just like, oh, I don't want to make a fuss because it's only $5, but it's awkward. So because it's what we do, right? And so for us, um, as a bank, if we go, if we can face into that problem of, of kind of that small, like payment issue, all of a sudden you start to unlock some really interesting relationship changes. And so for us, it's, that's really the heart of solving some really kind of deep-seated kind of payment innovation. If we can change that, um, what experience would that give consumers? I mean, how would that change people's lives? It was all equal. You didn't have to pay, like play the role of treasurer when all your mates are going on holiday, for example. And we all have someone in the group that plays that role. So if it was all enabled through APIs and through various kind of platforms, whether it be open with Paymark or with Akahu, um, that's when it gets really interesting. So I like to think that innovation is is driven at a customer um, expectation lens than a regulatory one or a tech one or otherwise. That's a really good point. I think the theme that has been thrown around today really is that customers, and at the end of the day, care about not the technology, but the experience. And we obviously have seen, not just as a payment company, but as every Kiwi, the trend towards contactless payment, right? Whether it's from your watch, your phone, or actually just straight card, right? That's a great example of people going for a low touch, but also friction, well, less friction of an experience paying in store. And I don't think people here, I mean, probably you do intimately know around the um, the rails, what we call the underlying technology that powers contactless. It's basically Visa Mastercard, so we call card schemes, but people don't really think about it, right? Uh, we just do it and the money moves and we're happy the merchant gets the money. Ultimately, we're basically looking at ways, and open banking is an alternative way to facilitate frictionless experiences. The problem with Visa and MasterCard, it's reliable, it's universal, but it does come at, at a cost to merchants. So you will see in the news merchants going well, the contactless fee really have lifted since COVID. And um, that's an example of, yes, consumer driving towards uh, experience, but not so much understanding the technology. And open banking kind of helps with that from a merchant point of view. That's usually the customers we see. So we basically serve our merchants. We give them an alternative to go, well, actually to get the same experience of frictionless payments to Josh's point, right? You can actually pay, and Lewis's point, you can pay people peer-to-peer -peer payment or paying with uh, tapping your phone, but not through necessarily the international card schemes, but through New Zealand open banking technology, we can have a direct link to your bank account and have a digital payment experience upfront. And that's, I think, big opportunity area for all of us to play and to change. And the other thing we think exciting is payments to, um, to Dave's point, right? It's no longer just about payments, it's about data. 
And if we think about paying with international card schemes, it's a very isolated process centered around just payments. You can't actually do loyalty at the same time. You have to take out another loyalty card. That's an example of what a open banking could do. If we know who you are and you're paying, your loyalty information could be processed at the same time as that part of the same data exchange. I would echo Lewis's point that there's nothing inherently broken about payments in New Zealand, but there are improvements that can be made from what we've got. And I think Will's mentioned two of them already. The cost of payments in New Zealand is high compared to other peer countries. Uh, another one that Will has mentioned is that they're, they're not data rich. So you could, do a, you could add a lot more information around a transaction that makes it helpful to the various stakeholders. Another couple that I think could throw on the table and we could explore. One is in New Zealand, payments tend not to be real time in the retail payment system. And I think there are a lot of use cases where that doesn't actually matter, but there are some use cases where it is important or valuable. Um, and then the last one that I'd throw on the table is around mobile payments. And obviously you can add cards into Apple Pay or Google Pay and so on. So we've, we've almost halfway migrated into the ability to do mobile payments but it's certainly not ubiquitous in New Zealand. And there, those other things we've mentioned about the cost of it um, and rich data around the transaction in real time, they're still not there, even with our current state of mobile payments. So those are, in my mind, the improvements that we can make um, to the current payment options. You, you, you guys are really doing my job for me. To be, <laughs> to be honest, this is fantastic. Um, just touching on some of that, do you think we're doing enough to stay ahead of the need to regulate more heavily? Is the ecosystem, because you're obviously innovating in your own rights, but as an ecosystem, are we innovating fast enough to stay ahead of that deep need of, of regulation? And merchants definitely got a lens during COVID and changed the focus on another player in the value chain that needs innovation to happen? Mm, loaded question. Um, so it's an interesting one, right? The role of the regulator um, can do some really good thing at, a, at an innovation lens. And it's it's an interesting metaphor, but take like Lime scooters, right? Like the rental scooter that we'll see on our main kind of streets. Um, not enabled by a cool tech company called Lime, enabled by a, the regulator. The city councils giving these guys kind of permits to to trial and operate so that was kind of regulatory kind of driven innovation or enabled innovation so regulation certainly kind of has a place um certainly at a cdr kind of lens and seeing what's happened in australia with with that that certainly kind of pushed the the velocity of, of, of change. Um, there's also the other side of the coin of, of regulatory potentially an inhibiting regulatory, regulation change. Um, take what's proposed, I guess, um, from the minister around kind of merchant service fees. Um, it gets quite interesting to go, that's a really good outcome for, for merchants and, and hopefully kind of consumers um, in the end. But would it potentially stop um, the, well, impact on the business model of fintechs or startups trying to create a brand new payments proposition because the business value isn't there anymore um, because the cost is coming down. So I guess you've got to be really kind of careful to see where what regulation can enable, but also make sure that it doesn't inhibit um, any new entrance to the, the ecosystem. Dave, I, I can see you itching to say something. I'd love to hear what you're seeing in other parts of the world, particularly Australia, that you would encourage in, in places like New Zealand. Yeah, thanks, Skippy. So a, a couple data points that I think can illustrate the role of regulator. So the UK has now been doing open banking for uh, since I think June 2018. Um, and what we saw in the UK, and, and this data is public, is that before all banks were mandated to share their data, so from June 2018 to about September 2019, the total number of open banking API calls uh, went from zero to about 100 million. Um, so some banks were coming online, but they were not yet required by the government to come online. In September 2019, that was the drop dead date when all banks had to have their data available. And the numbers grew from June 2019 to where we are today, from 100 million to 700 million API calls a day. So what you can see was that once all of the banks were forced to share their data, forced, you know, regulatory, regulators required that they share their data, you got a 7x increase in the number of APIs calls that were made. So I think that's one really helpful data point just to show the power of regulation can have on scaling open banking. 
a, a different data point is that we look in Australia, open banking has been live for a year now. And over the last 12 months, we've got nine accredited data recipients. Um, and I know I get our pipeline, I can talk to auditors, I can talk to the ACCC. Um, there are between three to 500 companies that will become data recipients, and there are probably 50 to 100 right now that would like to become data recipients. The reason that there are only nine is because the, the current requirements to become accredited are expensive and complicated. And so what that means is that companies that would otherwise move to open banking are either not going to open banking at all or are just sticking with screen scraping. So in those two data points, you can see two sides of the regulatory um, coin. One, in that in the UK, it was only once all banks were required to share their data that, that open banking actually took off at scale. Whereas in Australia, we are still subscale in the number of accredited data recipients because the regulatory requirements are complex enough that it's a deterrent. Now, the ACLC and Treasury are, are actively working to changing that. They're now opening up to what's called an intermediary model, which we can explain you know, if we want to get into that. But I just think that um, you, know, you can't oversimplify and say that it's good or that it's bad. Um, the regulator has a role to play, um, but regardless of what they do, there are going to be both benefits and detractions from what they do. I strongly echo both of your points here. And regulation, first, I should probably preface, I don't, this is my personal view, I don't want to piss off any lawyers. So I, I, I do feel that regulation is a double-edged sword as well. If it's done right, it can absolutely push progress and, and lightning speed. But if it isn't right, then actually it can do harm and actually make things more complicated. Um, we, I see Paymark obviously did FPOS 30 years ago with all the banks, and there wasn't any regulation around you shall do FPOS, right, in New Zealand. It just happened because as Kiwis, we actually are really good at figuring out what's right for the economy, what's right for our merchants, and what's, what's right for our end consumers and for our pa bank partners. And that came FPOS. Unlike FPOS, open banking is a lot more complex because it is a new technology and B, it is an ecosystem rather than just a single use case centered around payments. So if you have been wondering why it has taken so long for open banking to really become as ubiquitous as FPOS in New Zealand, it is because it is a harder problem. And it is, I think we as New Zealand are watching Australia, UK and parts of the world to see how they're doing with open banking and we're learning as well. And it does, hasn't stopped people like those of us in the room here actually pushing for progress, but we are still kind of figuring out what's the sweet point and what's the balance for, from a value point of view for merchants, for banks, for our end consumers as well. And if the regulation is done right, then once we get that sweet point and then push that out, then absolutely it will be very beneficial. But if the regulation, doesn't get that balance right, then I don't want to predict um, <laughs> what that future may look like. One thing we've seen with the start of the consumer data right policy making process in New Zealand is that it seems to have been a bit of an inflection point for the banks and other data holders to want to take the opportunities that are going to emerge in the space. So in, in my view, it won't just be fintechs that take advantage of consuming data when people want to share it, but incumbents as well. Um, so we've seen a bit of an attitude shift from maybe a bit, let's drag our feet, or we're not sure we want to expose customer data with their consent faster than we have to, to now thinking, okay, it's inevitable. There's going to be some regulation around this. So let's look for the opportunities and let's think about how we can create better customer experiences as well. So I think that's interesting because the, the regulation hasn't come in yet in New Zealand, certainly hasn't been finalized, but it's created a bit of an attitude shift, in my opinion, that has got this whole space moving faster. Um, so that's been like a positive externality of the start of a policy making process with CDR. Um, but to tack on something to David's point around the experience in Australia and the very few accredited data recipients over there, our message to MB is certainly let's right size this regime and let's make it better in all respects than the current state of unregulated pipes. So let's have better access to data, better ways of authenticating and authorizing. Let's make sure that the commercials don't prohibit people from getting involved and from people from consuming that data. So let's design it in a way that's right-sized for New Zealand 
um, and then it will truly be an enabler. And just one thing that I would add, it's important to note that regulation is an evolution. Um, it is not where it is set day one is not where it'll be at the end of year one, at the end of year five, so on and so forth. Um, and we've seen that very, very much in Australia where um, it was started by the ACCC. Now the policy making is being handed off to the Treasury. Um, and, and so the roles are changing, but so are both the policies and the enforcement, the, the way that it is um, enforced amongst the company, uh, amongst the regulators. Um, and, and to their absolute credit, uh, last week was Intersect in Australia. There were about 500 fintechs that went to the Fintech Australia conference and the ACCC and Treasury participated the entire time. They came out to dinner with us. They held round tables. They have been very, very open in seeking feedback and engaging with the fintech community. And what we're seeing is a, a much stronger relationship, a, a more open willingness to take on comments and to then work within the interest of, you know, the entire competitive landscape. Um, so I, I, I can't speak to what's happening in New Zealand, but you know, I think the fact that we are seeing the level of engagement and openness from the regulators and the policymakers with Fentech is making for a, a much, much better open data and open finance ecosystem. So while you're there, Dave, um, we, we've just heard about risk and opportunity in moving into an open banking world. So if you're talking to our audience here and online, um, what... If we can touch on technology for non-technologists, what types of things can organisations be doing to prepare to leverage the likes of innovation from Paymark and Harkahu, whilst also considering how they can mitigate some of the risk when it comes to handling data um, in an open environment? Um, it, it just decide what you want to own and what you're, what you're happy to outsource there are going to be certain parts of your open banking tech stack that are non-negotiables around security, around compliance, uh, perhaps around customer experience. Um, so those are the things that you will want to make sure that whether you build or buy, that you're doing that up to the standard that's required, you know, expected of your customers and of yourselves. Um, the other thing to note is that ultimately your competitive advantage uh, is not gonna be driven by how compliant you are with the regular regulatory regime, your competitive advantage is going to be driven by the customer experience and then what you do with that data. So the way that we work with our customers here, whether they're fintechs or they're banks, is we help them understand what are the parts of the tech stack that they should partner. So Akahu is a great example of the kind of uh, fintech that we would encourage our customers to partner with because the API integration, or the consent management uh, process flow, especially in Australia, is set by the regulator. And you will not build a competitive advantage by building a better customer consent process because the regulator is gonna tell you exactly the screens that you have to go through. But you will build a competitive advantage by building a better customer experience after the consent, by taking that open banking data and delivering something for your customer that your competitors cannot, or delivering it better. So, it's less around kind of what is the specific technology you should use than being very, very clear on where does your competitive advantage come from? Really, really invest in that. And then where there is the undifferentiated heavy lifting, find the best partners for you and double down on them and just go faster with them. I guess slightly different angle on, on that. For, for me, like for large um, enterprise customers that we have a lot of kind of um, conversations with at a bank level, for me, this whole change is is not a, a tech thing or it's it's more the, the mindset shift where where payments are moving to from from push payments, right? So typically as a, as a large business, you might focus on your, your core applications and at the end of that process, you might then bolt in a payment gateway. And it's like, oh, payments, oh, we'll get this third party to deal with that. And then the payment will come into my core SAP systems and then it'll be reconciled and then done. And so you're moving from this, this um, mindset of, of push. So a consumer pushes a payment to a merchant to pull where the merchant kind of using these APIs can pull payments from consumers. Now, it sounds like a, a subtle kind of change, but it, it, it is a completely different way of thinking about it because then inside the enterprise, um, the payment experiences can be more embedded. So it's not a, a 
uh, put it at the end of our process. It's like, how do we increase that that kind of um, retention of that customer by making the payment experience more frictionless? And that's part of my core offering. Um, so that whole, so for, for us, the, I guess the advice is kind of like, how do you think about it differently? If you had access to kind of these APIs, regardless of what the, the platform is that's, that's doing it, how can you re, rethink your entire customer experience? And whether that be you, you're, you're a cafe on the street with your, your traditional point of sale, how's that going to change? Right through to a large kind of public sector um, institutional kind of customer. Um, how do you completely change that historical experience? I love that point. And a couple of use cases that we're seeing in New Zealand, one is about that payments thought of at the last minute example. So if you sign up to an investment platform, let's say, and you go through the onboarding process, and then if you want to fund the digital wallet or make a payment in, usually the process will be, cool, here's a unique reference. Go out of our app to your bank app, plug in these details. Please make sure you include the reference. Otherwise, it will take us ages to reconcile it. And then we'll let you know at some point when your funds are received and reconciled, and then you can take the action that you want to do now. So if you connect a bank account up front in that process, it's an in-app experience um, and you can reconcile it because you help put in the, um, the particulars around that transaction. Um, and you have an ETA on when those funds are actually going to clear and be available to use in that app. So that's one example that we're seeing. Um, another thing that we're seeing quite a lot that I really like is we sort of call them empathetic payments. An example could be an energy company that's really sensitive to a vulnerable customer that maybe relies on medical equipment and needs power. Um, and so they want to be able to obviously get paid, but they don't want to be insensitive to a customer's financial situation, which may fluctuate a lot during the week that the billing goes out. So if you had a connected bank account and can check the available balance, you're never going to push someone into overdraft or dishonor fees. And maybe you want to time the payments with when income is received or when the available balance is over a certain threshold. So there are some use cases like that that you can enable once you've got that extra data to be able to be more empathetic or time things better or basically deliver a better customer experience. I'll probably just add two, well, two quick points then. <laughs> one is probably on the macro level and one's micro level around how to control risk while still delivering great experience. On a macro level, so there is an industry working group led by Payments New Zealand, and they're basically looking at the how, right? The what is use cases driven by the customers that we see, merchants and consumer, but the how is how do you do that security? So they're coming up with standards around security, authentication, and basically being able to manage the risk in an industry standardized way. And we're all part of that group, right? And actively contributing towards that. Uh, and then the micro level, I think the really a beauty about open banking is the control is in the hand of the end user. If you own the data, you are the one calling the shots around how much you share with whom in, for what use cases. And you actually as an individual run your own risk and reward balance. And then based on that, you can choose, okay, I really want this amazing experience, which means I'll give more access of my data to more people. Or actually, I only feel comfortable sharing this part of my data with this user, sorry, user being a platform like ours to access this kind of service. So the control is in your hand as well. I'm really interested in touching on the topic of the digital divide. We're here in Wellington, right? And But um, I want to start from a merchant perspective and how important is it that we give the ability for the majority of New Zealand businesses the ability to adopt new and emerging technologies at the point of sale to enable them to at least have a competitive advantage opportunity, if that makes sense. Do you have any view on that in the future, Will? From a merchant point of view? Yeah, about enabling those merchants across the board, not just focusing on our big warehouse groups, the countdowns. Yeah. That's an excellent question. I think part of Paymark's challenge, right, is how do we bring our merchants along that journey? Today's status quo, every merchant, almost every merchant in New Zealand has an FPOS machine, some of which still access, accept cash and or check, but mostly 
F was a sort of the not, baseline. Not chicks. No. <laughs> not <laughs> Great, great. No, awesome. Um, so I think the next future state, right, is obviously this open banking enabled digital technology. We can't get there from, for example, facial recognition is an ultimate experience where there's a camera, you walk in, people consent to their facial identity being linked to payments, loyalty, digital ID for payments, loyalty, and age verification, buying alcohol, for example, that's awesome. But we're not going to get there from a brick and mortar store running an FPOS machine connected to plugged in internet to that future state. So we see a equitable way of actually taking merchants on the journey being how do we evolve the FPOS machine or the terminals to actually be able to be smarter. So it still doesn't include, sorry, exclude people who are paying with the good old FPOS cards or the ones without a chip. So just swiping your card and put in their pin, but still able to allow for these new innovative ways built on open banking to be used on the same terminals. And good news is terminals in the terminal world, we are seeing innovations around terminals now coming out with enjoy capability. So you can write apps on it and do all these cool digital things, but still being able to carry a card based transaction. Terminals starting to have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, front camera. So we can actually start offering these other services. So that's one way that we are seeing and we do see um, that being that terminal being quite a big enabler for that journey. I, yeah, and I guess I 100% agree with that. And I guess what's of equal focus or what needs to be of equal focus to, to call it digital innovation is digital inclusiveness and, and both at a merchant business owner level, but also for consumers, right? Like, yes, we've got high smartphone penetration in New Zealand. We're a first world country, which is, which is great, but we're all not rocking iPhone 12s and stuff. Like, so you've got to have, make sure that as um, payments mature, right? And as we like get rid of checks and as cash slowly kind of starts to kind of dwindle down in, in usage and moves towards more digital payments. Um, that lower socio is not excluded from that. And so now technology can play a part in that, which is cool, right? So at a biometrics level, um, that person might not need a smartphone. Um, so for us, it's like, how do we make sure that we don't get too caught up in the the sexy kind of innovation for the the small kind of pe people who can access that? How do we make it um, inclusive for, for all New Zealanders? It's it's also worth noting that, you know, right now we're talking about face to face payments or card present payments. Um, but obviously, open banking payments will be valuable for e-commerce payments. So there are, you know, Kiwis, Kiwi farmers selling their goods online. There's a whole range of Kiwi businesses that won't have a storefront, but that are selling their goods online. And the cost of taking a credit card transaction online is significant. So it can be up to one, one and a half percent of your overall cost of goods and if you're only getting a five or ten percent margin then 10 you know 20 to 10 to 20 percent of that can be sent to um the, the gateways that are taking the credit card transactions so what we would also expect to see over time you can do open banking payments which is literally just using the internet rails for payments the cost of online payments should come down materially ultimately putting more money in, in the pocket of all of these online merchants as well are you seeing anything offshore, Dave, that sort of brings that digital inclusion um, with some sort of hardware to address access to digital payment technologies for people that don't have a smartphone? Uh, are there things that are operating um, around the world in that regard? Um, I think it's the other way around. I think that the smartphones are actually becoming the enablement for people that can't afford merchant terminals. Um, I think the best example of that is is Alipay in China. So so effectively, w the challenge in China was that most people didn't have credit cards, most consumers didn't have credit cards, and most merchants didn't have you know terminals. You know, Visa or Mastercard terminals. What they did have was smartphones. So what Alipay did was it completely sidestepped the scheme rails and said, well, we know that the consumer has a phone, we know that the merchant has a phone. Let's just use mobile to mobile payments via the internet to completely sidestep that. And all of a sudden what you saw was, you know, online digital payments absolutely skyrocketed. So it's hard to compare that to somewhere like New Zealand and Australia where, you know, FPOS terminals and, and credit cards are ubiquitous. But I actually think that mobile phones are often the answer 
to lack of payments infrastructure in places where credit cards and card schemes um, just are not normal. You see the same thing with M-Pesa in Africa. They didn't have the card infrastructure. What they had was mobile phones and not iPhones. These were Nokia flip phones where they were able to make to take and make payments via text message. So oftentimes mobile phones are actually the answer to lack of infrastructure as opposed to the, the challenge. I think that might even be a good time to talk about the type of solution that we might see in New Zealand soon, um, which is very similar to what Dave described, where you have some sort of consumer app where you can connect your bank account, maybe cards as well. And if it becomes ubiquitous, that then becomes really powerful method of payment for merchants to adopt. Um, and the problem with doing this from a cold start is that, you know, even if you could convince merchants to accept a new payment method, you don't have all the consumers with that app ready to use whatever the merchants have at the point of sale. So there's a couple of things that need to be solved. One is an app that becomes popular that can address the challenges we've got with payments, which is the cost of them, data rich, um, and ideally do it in real time and through mobile. And we need merchants to adopt, um, or for offline merchants or physical merchants, some sort of hardware that would enable the POS system to talk to the mobile app. Um, and we need this to happen at a similar time to make it all work together. Um, and there's certainly beginnings of that happening in New Zealand. And I think there'll be something that um, comes to market shortly. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, for, New Zealand has a great history of cooperative competition. In fact, that's what Paymark was really born out of to drive the adoption of a technology that enabled individual institutions to benefit from. So touching on that, um, do you still see New Zealand as being ahead of the game in, in fintech and innovation, or have we got a bit of catching up to do in some places? <laughs> that is what I call a loaded question. <laughs> I think it, it, in many regards, we are leading, in many regards, we're not. And part of it is, and I, I say this tongue in cheek, sometimes we, we internally talk about how FPOS simultaneously leads the game, but also inhibits new innovation because it is pretty good. By uh, today's point, overseas, we're starting to see people basically leapfrogging the whole FPOS terminal step, right? And actually going straight from cash to mobile-based wallet and payments, some using open banking rails, some just using completely different infrastructures that we obviously don't see here in New Zealand. And part of the reason is we have, to Lewis's point, some of the highest banked populations in the OECD world, plus the FPOS penetration rate is probably the highest, if not one of the highest in the world as well. So I think for us, it really, there's probably two aspects to it. A, we embrace what we have, and then we build on top of it as well. So part of our collective challenge is how do we then take the infrastructure that we have, don't throw it away and go, well, let's just go mobile. Mobile is great to Dave's point if it doesn't actually, um, you're solving a problem around not having the physical infrastructure around banking and post terminals and et cetera. But in our case, it's really how do we adopt what we have and have a New Zealand specific way of innovating using open banking technologies. And in terms of the competition, well, the friendly competition, I think for New Zealand, again, right, open banking is a much larger topic and really isn't just about payments anymore, even though we're here today to talk about payments. And ultimately, it probably was harder for there to be many pay marks to each run our own separate FPOS network because it's a very niche use case. But for open banking, there are a lot of use cases. I mean, Josh has talked about quite a few. I'll be talking to you, no doubt, about a few as well. But how do we actually work together as an ecosystem, each do our own bits, and perhaps some of it will do the same thing, but um, then it's really um, offering choices to merchants and to consumers. I think the, that that space of open banking, open finance is big enough for a lot of players to really come together, collaborate, and um, really do it together. I'll be controversial. Um, 
I think we're a laggard. I think the last payment innovation we did was FBOS. Um, and I think there's anything since then. Um, everything else has been um, inherited either um, with our scheme friends or our large tech friends like Apple and, and Google. Um, I don't think um, we've seen really anything since FBOS come out of little old kind of Aotearoa. Um, but, I, but what excites me out of that is where we're currently at. If you look at the the broader startup ecosystem, even outside of fintech, and you see a lot in, in Wellington and Auckland's kind of catching up as well, which is cool. There's amazing businesses being kind of created every day. And so with platforms um, like Akahu, like um, opening up those kind of historically kind of private kind of um, APIs from including us in the banks and other third parties, what I hope is that kind of convergence of the growth and startups in New Zealand combined with the enablers like that, um, and hopefully some good kind of regulatory kind of paradigms as well, um, we will see some innovation. Um, and so that's what gives me kind of hope. I think the last 20 years since FBOS um, has been um, kind of embarrassing for New Zealand. Like we're known to kind of do cool things around the world and you see it with with Zero and, and what they've done and the growth of that. Um, I think it's about time that we see some, some good payment innovation come to New Zealand. Um, I think New Zealand FinTech is like New Zealand rugby. You guys kick ass. You, way, way more than <laughs> the, the size of what you would expect um, from your country. Um, yeah, with you know, with Zero and Vend, and um, now we're seeing Montu and Atomic, and we're seeing some great co com uh, companies. You over-index on B two B fintechs, so you're very good at at, de at developing and exporting B two B fintechs that are doing deals with banks. Unique would be another example. Um, I think to Lewis's point, probably a little bit underwhelming in terms of payment innovation, um, but what's happening now is the exactly right steps towards getting there. It just depends on how open that ecosystem is and, and you know, how much um, the ecosystem is willing to you know, en enable innovation and create open APIs and create easy access regimes and things like that. But overall, New Zealand FinTech's awesome. Uh, Dave, why are you there? Um... And we'll start to wrap this up. What's the next big shift? What's what's the next big bet in innovation in the payment space from a from a technology perspective? What would you be hedging your bets on? Well, the next real big bet's crypto. Um, I think that goes without saying. But um, the nearer term bet, well, in Australia, it will be turning payments on for CDR. So, unlike in New Zealand, in Australia, it is read only, which means the only use cases are those which are which involve getting a consumer's data and providing it to someone else the next step will be right access which will likely go via the npp the new payment platform in australia which is our real-time payment platform and once that is enabled then we will see a whole range of new use cases around real-time payments getting businesses money faster it will enable better lending it'll reduce fraud it'll reduce payment friction um, i think that if you look at the uk and you look at a company like true layer they've got a whole bunch of public use cases where they talk about um, what they are doing to enable companies like revolut um, to do open banking payments um, that will come in australia i think new zealand new zealand will probably get there faster the way that you guys are rolling out open banking. But I think from an open banking perspective for Australia, that the next big thing for us will be payments. And for Will and Josh to finish this up, I want you to cast your eyes ahead to 2025 and it's Christmas and you're looking to stuff the stocking. Can you paint us a picture each of that consumer payment experience and getting those gifts into the stocking? I would walk into the shop, select a bargain gift, which is also very high quality, and take it up to the counter, and uh, the person would load the transaction. I would open my payment app, scan the QR code. I would have an electronic receipt sitting there. Um, it would have initiated that payment, which I then authenticate with my face or my finger, um, and then I'm done. But that won't take till 2025. That should be by 2022. <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, Will. I agree. I think with the, we, we're going to really start to see some really cool use cases coming out on the market a lot sooner. Not to say the whole New Zealand adoption curve will be right going from zero to 100 in a year. There may still be people paying with cash in 2025, but I think there will be good technologies out there serving a segment of offering choice to a segment of our consumers and merchants out there. 
2025, hope, first of all, hope COVID is gone as a thing. Um, and truly, I think payment itself, right? We've started seeing that trend of payment actually disappearing, right? To Josh's point, it shouldn't really be a conscious act anymore. You should just be able to do it without even realizing that you just paid. So facial recognition, right? You, you pick all your stuff. Facial recognition recognizes who you are. There may be a second factor authentication and that's done. And ironically, even though we see payments becoming nothing, it's actually becoming everything as well. So from a enrichment of that transaction, we're seeing that actually becoming, evolving into an interaction rather than just a transaction. So at the same time you're making that payment, you're earning loyalty points. And at the same time you're making that, you, we're verifying your eligibility if you, you know, with our youthful looks, right? Sneaking in that bottle of wine, right? With part of that facial recognition, you don't have to wait for the supervisor to come and check your ID. It's all done as part of that interaction. And then you get your digital receipts and um, anything else that you choose to enable as part of that transaction. And that's done in a way that is lower cost than today with contactless. And it's done in a way that's far more secure and lower fraud, so no chargeback from a merchant's point of view. And for you, Lewis, if you cast your eye to 2025 Christmas and you've just stuffed a new venture into your stocking, what does that venture look like? I think there's a one coming before this Christmas, but we'll, really, we'll let you guys wait for that one. Um, I, I'd kind of echo kind of Will's point. I like. Um, I think payments need to disappear. Um, like it kind of happens today, right? Like Uber from the airport today. Like the taxi driver doesn't ask me how would you like to pay for that. I just get out. So I want that experience um, in a retail store. I want that experience with an online store. I want to be able to control that and kind of consent to what account or method of payment, whether that be kind of off my home loan or off my transactional account, I want to be able to enable that. But at an interaction level, um, I don't want anyone to ask me the question, how do you want to pay for it anymore? Um, which I reckon will be incredible because then we can then have different experiences, whether they be in a store or online. The conversation's not around transaction. The, the conversation's about the product or the, the service or the after sales. Um, yeah. So you guys want to shop at the Amazon Go store? Oh, <laughs> good plug. Um, we might welcome Jason, my esteemed CEO, back to uh, ask the audience here some questions and some curated online questions. Thank you, Skippy, and thank you, speakers. That was uh, fascinating. Look, there's a few sort of points I'm, I sort of noted as I went through, which I thought were, were really good. So I love the comments around digital inclusion. You know, the, and digital inclusion includes an Apple iPhone or a Nokia flip phone and doing things through text. I thought that was a great, great insight. The second one, I'm glad people brought up about um, the payment experience in China. So I'm old enough that I was traveling in China in the early 90s, and that was all cash everywhere. Then I've been lucky enough to go there a number of times over the, over the years, and last year, only about three years ago. And everything was WeChat and on the phone and people waving their phones at each other not asking about what your bank account is. And to me, that was seamless payments. And what a revolution. Uh, so a great piece of a country doing some st stuff which is really innovative. And and the quote I really loved is around the customer experience is your competitive advantage. Let others do the heavy lifting. So I thought that was, that was great as well. So thank you, guys. That was some really good. Now, question time. Only a few from online. And then this is your chance to think of questions on the floor. No pressure, Lara. I saw you writing lots down. <laughs> so first one, which is a two-part question, so bear with me as I work through this. So do you believe open banking is enabled by APIs or is using screen scraping, or is using screen scraping still enabling open banking? Supplementary question behind that is, is there a security or trust concern about screen, safe, screen scraping? So whoever would like to tackle that one? I can take that. And I think the answer is yes to both. It's a suboptimal way of version of open banking because you need a middleman that you authenticate and authorize with and you need to trust that middleman. Regulated open banking will remove that. You'll be able to authenticate and authorize directly with the data holder. So that is the optimal way to do it. But um, this is the best we can do in the current state in the absence of feature complete public APIs from all the data holders. 
And we've talked a bit about Australia and the UK on this panel and their versions of open banking or consumer data right legislation. Another market that we watch closely is the US. They don't have enabling regulation that dictates that data holders have to make APIs available, but they do have a lot of consumer data portability. So if you've seen apps like Venmo and Cash App and TransferWise and Coinbase, you have the ability to connect your bank account and then interact with that bank account in those apps. And that's enabled by intermediaries like Akahoo, like Plaid. Um, and that all exists in their current state of open banking, which is actually very similar to what we've got in New Zealand. So I guess our view is that we shouldn't wait for regulation, which I think is going to be years away before it actually starts enabling uh, better access than what, we, what we've currently got. I think we should get started now like they have in the US and unleash this wave of innovation. And then we should evolve in those more refined forms of them over time when it becomes available. If I just chip in there and being, I guess, very objective, right? It is that whole, yes, if we go down the API route today, there are APIs out there and Paymark are pursuing those. And what comes at a cost is the APIs aren't consistent. So if you want to offer a whole suite of functionalities that perhaps from a customer experience point of view, you should, then you wouldn't be able to all do that via API. So it, it comes at a decision balancing the risk, but also at the, well, I guess, and customer experience. So if we go down the API route, you could do something and you do it through a, as part of the PNZ standards, right? So it's part of the industry um, way of collaborating the consumers and the merchants will basically be excluded from accessing the whole power of open banking. So that's, I think, the decision. Uh, 100%, and yes and yes. And and for for us, it's how do you, again, kickstart the innovation in, in New Zealand around kind of financial services? Um, sure, screen scraping is, is, is not the long-term play um, for the industry, and nor it kind of should be, but it certainly goes, it gives it a really good kind of kickstart. Um, obviously, Josh and Aku is a partner and a portfolio company of ours, um, so we kind of believe in that technology, but we also believe in, in what that could enable for New Zealanders. But long-term, it will be... Um, all the banks um, supplying authentic authenticated APIs um, to the ecosystem. Right, and Dave, any comments? Oh, good, because the next one's directed at you, buddy. <laughs> so, but then I will open it up to the other panelists. So David, could you elaborate on how do you decide where do you focus your efforts for a growing ecosystem? So it, this, this question in terms of how do you build out, like how should a company build out their open banking no, with capability. The AWS hat on and everything that you could do, how do you prioritize and focus on where to build out the ecosystem? Um, so we we go where we think the, we're going to have the biggest impact on fintech overall. Um, so the reason that we focused on open banking is to that point that I made before. We think there will be five, 300 to 500 data recipients. And we know that there are many, many businesses that are going to be built off the back of that data. These are new lending companies that want to be able to access transaction history. These are wealth management apps that want to be able to provide um, you know, real-time analytics on how you're investing. These are budgeting tools that want to be able to help customers budget and save more. Um, from there, we then just think about where else can AWS lean into to accelerate um, the growth of the ecosystem. So things like how can we use machine learning um, to accelerate credit risk. So we spoke previously about um, inclusion. Uh, one of the biggest ways that people are excluded from uh, access to capital is because they have very thin or no credit files. So there are ways that you can use machine learning to improve a lender's ability to lend further down the lending stack. So we're looking at things like that. And then obviously security and compliance, you know, is always what AWS focuses on first. And if you are going to be a successful fintech and you are going to hold customers' data, then you have to build secure and compliant capability. So we are always going to focus on that. That will be a constant for us. Great. Thanks, Dave. Anyone else like to answer that? No? Great. All right. I shall move on. So, and I'll open this to all panelists. So just um, sing out. Payments in New Zealand work well other than cross-border payments. 
how will open banking help fix cross-border payments? Who would like to have a go at that? Yeah, I, I think I would acknowledge that first point that payments work fine in New Zealand, but I do think coming back to some of the improvements that can be made to the current system, there are some, some significant material improvements that can be made. Um, in terms of cross-border payments, yeah, open banking doesn't really help with that. Um, you know, I think Dave rightfully mentioned crypto or blockchain. If we're talking about the future of payments, then I think we've got to include that in the discussion. And that's the kind of new infrastructure that doesn't have all these legacy, all this legacy baggage that comes with it that can enable cross-border payments to be done far more efficiently. Um, I don't think it's clear what solutions are going to rise out of all the projects that are going on at the moment or whether they'll be the ones that don't exist yet. I think we can look at some attributes that will be there like stable coins, um, like real time and so on. But um, yeah, cross-border stuff is really hard because you've got all this infrastructure that has been built in different environments and it's hard to make it all work together seamlessly. So new infrastructure is almost easier. I'll probably add in agree. I think Josh's point, right? Every country's got their own open banking version, right? So lining that up will be probably harder than just starting with a worldwide open banking standard, which is hard in itself. So what I do see though, open banking really serves is being that last mile of pipe into cross-border processes who just specialize in moving money around. So we can all think of a few companies off the top of our head. We're actually working with one to actually, if you look at some of these digital players who move money around really efficiently, what really sucks, and Josh alluded to this earlier, right, is you have to, well, how do you get money into that wallet? How do you actually get money from your New Zealand bank account to the environment? And that's where open banking help can help, right? It's rather than actually punching in, doing a manual bank transfer, you are doing an open banking transaction, maybe using your mobile phone as an identifier, you punch that in and put to select your bank and you approve that transaction in your bank environment. And from a last mile point of view, we sort that issue out with open banking. And then at least before crypto comes in, we are actually having a pretty good experience joining up with these specialized cross-border payment providers. And I guess building on top of that, certainly when you start talking cross-border, um, a lot of the regulatory kind of challenges um, come into it. And so um, AML is one of those huge concerns in terms of cross-border, same with kind of sanctions. So I guess the interesting opportunity there and whether the, the offshore pipes be blockchain-based or, or SWIFT or otherwise, um, how do you kind of connect that last mile of pipe of open banking, but to bring through enriched information? And whether that be KYC information on the customer that both parties can then can have full visibility on through that. Um, and so I think there's a happy medium of technology kind of starting to solve some really kind of grunty kind of problems um, at an AML level. And there's, there's a lot of kind of really kind of bad stories into that. So if we can solve it that through technology, but also that will then overlay in terms of um, customer experience and how do you um, be able to send $5 to an auntie in Sydney and that kind of thing. So that's the exciting part. Sorry, thank you, Lewis. Dave, any final thoughts on that in terms of cross borders? Yeah, I, I would I would just add cross border investments to the payments conversation. Um, so what you see one of the biggest use cases out of the UK is in the people's ability to load their investment or crypto apps much more quickly than you would otherwise. So where we are seeing a significant increase in people uptaking um, investments on the ASX or in crypto or you know in the in the UK. Um, one of the biggest hurdles is the amount of time that it takes to actually get your money into these apps. And so something like open banking, this is the point that was being made before, it just makes the on-ramp into those apps and people's ability to access um, those apps in a timely manner um, significantly better, you know, from three days to real time. Thanks, Dave. All right. So all that remains is a few thank yous and sign off. So if you do, it sounds like there's going to be a pretty good after match function with a few questions. So we'll get into that shortly. Um, if you do have any questions of Frond or the panelists, please feel free to, uh, free to tackle us here tonight or online. We'll be more than happy to follow up with you. Um, I want to give out a few thanks. So firstly to our panelists, thank you very much. Um, it was great. There is a big time impost in thinking about this kind of thing. So I really appreciate um, the team coming down here and participating. 
Thank you to Skippy for referring. Done. Thank you for AWS and my team working behind the scenes to pull this um, off. Thank you.